Okay, let's go back a little bit in history. Here we are in Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte is uh, billed as the Queen City because it's named after Queen Charlotte, who was married to George III, the tyrannical king that caused the American Revolution. She came from a place called Mecklenburg. That's why we have Mecklenburg County. But before it was named Charlotte and before Mecklenburg was known as a county, this place was settled by a rigid bunch of Bible-believing Christians. We call them Scots-Irish or Scotch-Irish, whichever you prefer. They were those that came out of Scotland, moved to Ireland and the northern part of Ireland where all the Protestant lived, Protestants lived. And then from there, they immigrated to the United States in the early 1700s. At first they landed in New England, but if you know anything about New England territory, they were not friendly to these fire-breathing Protestants, these Presbyterians. New England didn't like them. So they went to Pennsylvania where the Quakers were. It's a little easier there in Pennsylvania. They slid down to Virginia. Virginia is where all the Anglicans were. Episcopalians is what we call them. And the Anglicans didn't want anything to do with the Presbyterians. So they kept moving. From Pennsylvania, they came across the old wagon road down into the Piedmont of North Carolina. They settled this area where we are right now. 1750, uh, some of the churches you'll be familiar with, Chagall Creek Presbyterian Church, um, Rocky River Presbyterian Church. Uh, there are a couple others. Even Mint Hill, although it wasn't part of the very first, there were seven churches that were established by a man named Alexander Craighead. He was a fiery preacher. The kind of Presbyterians that came through, they, they're not the cold, like the cold Presbyterians. Like if, you're, if you were a former Presbyterian, there's this staid and true, kind of nothing ever changes Presbyterian. These Presbyterians were the, what they call the new side Presbyterians or new light Presbyterians. They were fueled by men like George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. They were part of the very first Great Awakening. Alexander Craighead caught that. Planted all these churches around here. They love the gospel. They love the Bible. They love to teach. They won people to Christ. That's kind of our history here in Charlotte, North Carolina, Mecklenburg County. That was 200 years ago. Just out of curiosity today, I went to three of those churches, their websites, and listened to the sermons being preached there. And the the absolute vacuous nature of having no Bible preached, no gospel spoken of, no God pointed to. Uh, one, one sermon, a lady was preaching, and uh, I mean, at least she was up there in front, and she was using a cartoon, a movie about emotions. I don't know what the movie was, but she, that became the entire message. What happened from 1750 when Alexander Craighead was, Craighead was breathing fire? What happened from there to now? It's a long slide down. It brings us to Nineveh. Nineveh is a city that we are aware of. We have heard of Nineveh before. Do you remember where we heard of Nineveh before? The book of Jonah. Jonah told us about Nineveh, and Nahum is really like a sequel to the book of Jonah. Never thought of it like that until recently. Jonah told us about, we get hung up with Jonah, we think about him. Really, it's about what God did in Nineveh, and the town of Nahum, the city of Nineveh, the book of Nahum becomes a sequel. It tells us the rest of the story and the 100-year slide. When you read Jonah, it's a great book. Really, Jonah looks terrible in the book of Jonah. God looks great because he brings revival. Jonah's story is of, of Nineveh hearing this message of, in three days, if you don't repent, God is going to destroy this city. And revival broke out. You know the story. And God relented. He did not punish them. Now, a hundred years later, we go back to Nineveh. And we see what's happening there. Let's set it up. If you have in front of you the note sheet, you've got a couple of places to write things down if you'd like. Right there beside the date, 
Uh, the book of Nahum, it's only three chapters. It was written between 664 B.C. and 612 B.C. And we know that because if you flip over to chapter 3, verses 8, 9, and 10, and you don't need to do that now, but you can just write it in the margin. Chapter 3, 8, 9, and 10, uh, there you have Nahum speaking of a place called Thebes. And we know from other historical documents that the city called Thebes in Egypt fell in 664. We know that. So it couldn't have been written beyond that. And we also know that Nineveh as a city fell in 612. So it couldn't, couldn't have been written after that. Somewhere between 664 and 612, let's just put it at 640 B.C. is when Nahum wrote it. I've said his name several times. Let's go by the author. The author is a man named Nahum. We know absolutely nothing about him at all. Nothing. I mean, you can read. Here's what we know in verse 1. This is an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. We got his name from Elkosh. We don't know where that is. It's not been found. So all we know is he was a prophet and he wrote this down. We do know a little bit more. Uh, we know that what his name means, his name means to comfort, to console, which is odd because in Nahum, everybody's going to hell. Have you read it? I mean, it's bad news right here. And so his name is to comfort and to console. It's a, Nahum is a shortened form of the name Nehemiah. So you can hear the consonants uh, in the name. It's also, uh, just out of curiosity, the place called Capernaum. Capernaum. You've heard about it in the, in the New Testament. Capernaum is translated as the village of Nahum. Caper Nahum. Capernaum. So those are interesting facts about Nahum. That's about all I can come up with with Nahum. Is that's about all we actually know of him. What is the purpose like when you read this little book, you get to it in your Bible reading and you're going in a Bible reading plan and you get to Nahum, you might say, what is this, like why? How does this help me? So the stated purpose for Nahum is, I'll just give you directly. The purpose is the Lord's coming judgment of Nineveh. That's why it's here to tell God's people, to tell Nineveh, that God is going to judge, and he does when we look at history. What is the situation? Let me, let me set the situation up of Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. We're dealing with the Assyrians. If you've read the Old Testament, you know we've run into the Assyrians, then the Babylonians. The Assyrians are the first ones to take it, Israel off, and the Babylonians finish the deal in exile. The Assyrians are the first people to actually have an empire. Like in the United States, we are not empire builders. We've got the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Gulf, and we're not interested in colonizing the rest of the world. We know a little bit about the, think about the British Empire. I used to say that the sun never sets on the Union Jack. Assyrians were the first ones to do that. That they left their territory and started to spread out over the Middle East. After the Assyrians had their empire, the Babylonians came in, they did it better. That's how we have so much knowledge about the Babylonians. The Babylonians destroyed the Assyrians while they're destroying Israel or, or Judah. And then after the Babylonians, you have uh, the Persians come in. So the Persians, and they've got an empire. Persians were strong for a while. Alexander the Great, he comes in, he beats the Persians. Then the Romans come in. Then you know the rest of the story about the Roman Empire. So the Assyrians were the very first ones to actually have an empire. And a part of their empire was, was bulldozing over Israel. But the capital city of this great empire was a place called Nineveh. Nineveh was an amazing town. It really was more like a big city, like a mega city. Think of this. Think of it now. Think of the, the walls around Nineveh would be nine miles all the way around. The walls at Nineveh were a hundred miles feet high. Like I was trying to conceptualize that today. 
How did they build with no equipment? A hundred feet high, the walls were so thick, you could take three chariots, line them up, and race on top of the wall. On the outside of the wall, if that's not enough, on the outside of the wall was a moat that ran all the way around Nineveh. That moat was 60 feet deep and 150 feet wide. This was an impressive structure. I tell you all of that to, to bring to the forefront, when you hear this prophecy, it doesn't seem possible. I mean, I mean none of us seems like it is absolutely indestructible. And really, that's the setup for, if I were preaching this, this is how I would preach it. I would say, no one and nothing can stand against God. You know, you can't help but draw these parallels um, with Nineveh and America. No one and nothing can stand against God. One of the things that I love to read about is, is history, and a whole lot of history is dominated by wars and military. And uh, it, it wasn't until during World War II and afterwards we became this, super, this world superpower. There is a real sense of taking some logical pride in the strength of America, but you look around the world now and you remember that no empire lasts forever. So what do we do with this passage when we think about uh, where we are, 2024, Christians living in Charlotte, North Carolina? Well, here's what I would do with it. I would, first of all, look at the character of God. Character of God. The char it's probably on your note sheet. You'll find it there. You'll find the character of God from verse 1 to verse 8. Verse 1 is the introduction. We meet Nahum, and then he gets automatically into a poem. So if you're reading this, reading this in the original language, it would be Hebrew, and it would be listed like an acrostic, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, Hek, Pet, Yod. That's the, that's the Hebrew alphabet, and each line starts with one of those letters. There's an acrostic poem from verse 2 to verse 8. This is a, this is a poem. And what do we learn about God in verse 2? What do we learn? We learn that He is a jealous God. Let me show it to you. The Lord is jealous. Do you see that? The, the Lord jealous. Not like, not like I might get jealous. Not like you would get jealous of your husband or wife. The Lord is jealous in that he will not tolerate any kind of false worship of a false God. And here is Nineveh, a whole city built on false worship. And part of the poem is this. You should know that God does not tolerate that. He's a jealous God. He's jealous of our affections. He knows that he is the best for us. Why is God jealous of you? God is jealous of you because he knows that which is best for you is him. That's why he's jealous of you. Not because he is some sort of possessive, angry God, but because his desire is for you to have the best. And what is best for you is him. And so, jealous. What, about, what else do we know, learn about God? The character of God, we hear that he is an avenging. Look at verse 2. What does the text say? The Lord is jealous. He is an avenging God. The Lord is avenging. Down to the third line. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. Avenging God. You might put that in the category of, of justice. If you want to think about the character of God, you would say he is a just God. When a crime is committed, a punishment will follow. We understand justice. We have a full judicial system here in the United States. We have courts to adjudicate and to find out what is right. If something has happened and it deserves to be punished, we want, it that, we want that crime punished. God is absolutely just, which is really bad news if you don't have the gospel. Like when you read Nahum, you got to read it as a Christian. You read it in light of the gospel, and it makes you so thankful. If our God is a just God, and if you actually get what you really deserve as an abject sinner, 
If you got justice, instead, we go to the cross and we preach it every Sunday that justice fell on Jesus and justice is served on Jesus, mercy is given to us. That's, that's the gospel story. That's what Nahum is for to remind us that this God is a, is a just God. And that should be preached. It should be spoken of. It is an unloving thing to keep from telling people that without Christ, they're under the, the vengeance of God. Okay, what else about God's character? He's wrathful. Verse 2. Like when you read verse 2, doesn't it sound personal to you? The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. He has adversaries and enemies. When I read this over and over again, this felt very personal to me. You know how you take some things, you let roll off your back. Some things, you just take, it just strikes you. Like if you're a preacher uh, and you take preaching very seriously and you take it personally and uh, someone sends you a long email about your sermon and how terrible it was. It just, it's, you take it personally. You can't, people say, don't take that personally. That was about me. It's personal. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, when you read this text, you find out God takes it so personal. Like when you think of, of what God has given you, how he has created you, how he's constantly provided for you, the air that he's put into your lungs, the fact that you have clothes on your back, you're sitting in an air-conditioned building, all of these unbelievable, constant thousands, millions of gifts that he's invested into you. There is this personal, and then if you go further and think about the gospel and what, Christ, what God has done for us in Christ, it is personal. And then, then those that would hear all of that and see it and reject it and become an enemy of God, you read verse 2, he is a wrathful. Like this is an offense to God. Wrathful. What, about, what else about the character of God? Well, that was sort of uh, a negative side to a coin that is the character of God. Let's flip the coin over and there is something beautiful there. Verse 3 says that he's patient. Did you see that in verse 3? Look what the text says. By the way, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up the pace. Uh, I'm, I'm spending so much time here because verse 2 and 3 are virtually all judgment on Nineveh. Like when you, chap, when you read chapters 2 and 3, it is judgment, 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 judgment. Only so much that you can read uh, on a Wednesday night. So I'm spending some time here because verse 2 to 8, you have the character of God. And I want you to see it, if God is the same, we need to know his character. And verse 3 tells us he is patient. Nahum says the Lord is slow to anger. You might say he's, he's shown patience to you. If you became a Christian when you were an adult, and you can remember long enough a life before that of living in rebellion against God and how long he waited, how he kept you alive, how he prevented you from being in the car wreck, how he kept you how he brought you to someone so that they could give you the gospel and you could be saved, you ought to read that and think, thank God he was slow to be angry with me. Because he could have immediately, the first time a curse word came from your mouth, he should have struck you dead. But he, but he didn't. He's slow to anger. And, and even, after, even after becoming a child of God by being purchased by the blood of Jesus, so patient with us as he waits and, 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 and grows you from fits and starts, two steps forward and one back. But even that is progress, two steps forward and one back. He's patient, slow to anger. What else about God? Verse 3. <clears throat> the Lord is slow to anger and he is great in power. I, I love the word sovereignty. Sovereignty. You, you should love the word sovereignty. You, you should... You should think deeply about how sovereign God is. Like you should think, let your mind conceive how big is God and God is bigger than anything you can come up with. That his power is unlimited 
And that is a comfort to my soul, honestly. When I think about the future, the reason we have, the reason we have anxiety is we are anxious of the future. Regret is something we look back, it's past. Anxiety is the future. And so, so sovereignty helps with anxiety. Grace takes care of, of regret. When you think of God's power, you think of his, what he's doing, how he works beyond anything we know. Nahum says, the Lord is slow to anger. He is great in power. Oh, I've already used just, but I'll use it again. He will not, verse 3 says, he will not clear the guilty. He will not clear the guilty. There's, the gospel is bound up in there. Hey, the gospel is there. The cross is right there. He will not clear the guilty. So, so two ways to look at that. If you're a Christian, be careful how you think of what God has done with your sin, that God has granted a mulligan if you play golf. Just a free shot. That is not how God takes care of your sin. Or that God has given you, he said, okay, you know what? I understand. He has not cleared the guilty. He has taken our guilt and placed that guilt on his own son. The guilt is not cleared. The guilt is atoned for. Like the price is paid. Punishment is served. Justice has been kept. That our God can be fully just and fully merciful at the same time. That at the cross, the two meet and kiss there in Christ. Nahum is a reminder to me of how I need the gospel. He's just. He's also, I don't know how else to say this. Verse 3b down to verse 5. I'm going to say that he's, uh, he's seen. Seen. I don't know how else to say it. I'll, I'll explain it. Verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt the earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. That is, that is a, that is a, the writer here is saying, there's some things that have happened in my life that I have seen. There, there's no explanation except God. When we see natural things happen, it's good to, to remember that God is seen in natural phenomena. When we see some wild storm spool up in the gulf, and you think God is 10 millions more, times more powerful than that. When you hear of an earthquake or you watch a volcano explode or some natural disaster, there you have these, these, these tangible reminders, these phenomena that say God is powerful. He's seen. I would say in verse 6, he's overwhelming. There is this sense in verse 6 that who can, who can stand before his indignation? Like, this is why we preach the gospel. This is, why we, uh, this is why our church is a Southern Baptist church. Who can stand before his indignation? Southern Baptist Convention is made up of 47,000 Baptist churches. Baptist churches like ours, we are an actual independent church. We're a standalone church. What we have decided is we will voluntarily cooperate with other churches sending money to support missionaries who will then live on the field and share the gospel because nobody can stand in front of his indignation. That's why we're Baptist, because we believe that God judges sin. There are people around the world that have not heard the gospel, and because they are sinners, they're going to hell. Because you can't stand against up to his indignation. This is what's so fearful. Um, okay, let me keep moving. The character of God. God is, verse 7, God is safe for his children. Like he's terrible to his enemies. But for his children, look at verse 7. Verse 7. <clears throat> the Lord is good. The Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. The Lord is good. The Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. Are y'all familiar with uh, 
a uh, television show called the 700 Club. No, the 700 Club is on uh, Pat Robinson, okay. So I think Pat Robinson is dead, is that right? So the 700 Club uh, showed up here uh, Tuesday and interviewed me. I had like a, they were here for several hours. That, so I hope I didn't embarrass us, uh, by the way. I, won't, I said, y'all send me the clip when you're done. Uh, it's coming out September the 6th. So they came and did um, a long interview, and they asked questions about our church and about me being the president. And they, uh, the lady asked how we, how did you deal with Nate dying? I was like, well, you know, the Lord is good. You talked about the church because you know our church was so good to us. But there is a sense where, like, isn't that when I mean when there's such trouble and pain that you like don't you sometimes wonder how do people make it without the gospel without the Lord without the church and here's this promise for for his children we run there and he is the stronghold we find out that Christ is enough for us that he heals our pain that he carries us that he brings us people that he ministers to us and does that with the church that's the character of God that he, he cares for his children. He's safe for you, his child. That's one side. Flip it over. Verse 8 tells us some danger, though. There's danger. Verse 8. <clears throat> that God is a danger to his enemies. A danger. I'll just read it for you. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. Now, this is a proclamation against a town named Nineveh that is surrounded by walls that are 100 feet tall, or surrounded by a moat. It's close to the sea. It's impregnable. And yet the promise is you can't stand against God. Okay, so that's the character of God. You might write down a couple of things that I've mentioned there. I'd like to take you very quickly. I've got two or three of these that I'll go quickly through then maybe make some application. I'd like to talk about hoping in God. So that was a proclamation about the character of God. From verse 9 to verse 15, especially when I get down to verse 15, I'll read it. Let me just read all of that to you. But verse 15, what you find there is this... Um, is this hope in, for Judah. And Judah is not a player on the national scene. Assyria is a giant empire. Nineveh is a giant city. Judah, I mean, they're, they're nothing. They're not even an incorporated town. Like they're riding, you're trying to get to Charlotte, and you 20 years ago rode through Belmont. Now, what are they doing in Belmont? Belmont didn't mean... It's now a really nice city. But back then, you're like, what is that even there? That's the way Judah, Israel, that's where they were in this, in this setting. And yet, look what the Lord says. Verse 9, I'll just read from verse 9 to verse 15. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, fully dried. From you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength, this is the Assyrians, though the Assyrians are at full strength and are many, they'll be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, this is to Judah, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break this yoke from off of you, and will burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given commandment about you. This is to Judah. No more shall your name be perpetuated from the house of your gods. Now to Nineveh. I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave. For you are vile. Now to Judah. Here's the hope. Finally get there. Behold upon the mountains. The feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows. 
For never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. There's a promise in there. there there's a, a, when I read it, I found a hope for Judah, who is this non-essential city. Like during, when I think about all that happened in history during that time, you go to the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Greeks, and the Romans. Then you'll right, go into the British Empire and Europe. It, you, Judah's nothing. And yet God has chosen to reach in, to protect and to love. And there's the whole picture of grace. It's the whole picture of the gospel. That you and I are not standing out and living in such a way that God has recognized and seen that we're really good people. And you know what? He's going to turn out all right, so I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to help him. No, that's not grace. That would be in some way earned. Grace is when God looked at us in our terrible condition and saw that we would let him down, that we would cheat and be unfaithful. And yet grace is he gave Jesus for us, for sinners like us, it's a reminder of the picture of God's loving grace. You know what grace does? It makes you... So this is the difference between a works-based religion like Catholicism and a grace-based religion like Christianity. Works-based religion says, okay, God, he is good, but I've got to do some things to make sure I, I will get the blessings that God says I can have. So it's God's grace, yes, that he blesses me, but I'm working toward it too. And... Grace and works work together. That is not a picture of Christianity. Christianity from the Bible is this, that God's good grace in Christ has saved us. And because we are aware of grace, that what we deserved was an eternal hell and damnation and judgment like, like Nineveh, because we deserve that, and yet God has given us such love. That love has, has kindled our hearts to want to serve him. So we serve out of grace, not to get grace. Do you see the difference? We, we, we serve because we've been changed. We don't serve hoping to be changed. That's the picture of, of Judah, God saving Judah. That's hope in God. And press a little further on it in chapter, let's take chapter 2 and 3. Let's mash them together. Lots of judgment there. I want to... Uh, I want to call your attention to the fear of God, the fear of God. A couple of things to read in chapter 2. Maybe I'll read some in chapter 3 too. Just join me there in verse 1 and follow along. The scatterer has come up against you. This is saying to Nineveh, man the ramparts, watch the road. You better dress for battle. Get all of your strength. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob and the majesty of Israel. For plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. The shield of his mighty men is red. The soldiers are clothed in scarlet. The chariots come with flashing metal. By the way, the chariots flashing metal, they're going to have like, like, like blades coming off the wheel. You see that here? The chariots come with flashing metal. On the day he musters them, the cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and, to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. The river gates are open. It's going to be flooded. And the palace melts away. And then you see the, the, the women now. The mistress is stripped. She's carried off. Slave girls are lamenting. They're moaning like doves. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt, halt, they cry. None turns back. Go down to chapter 3. Uh, come down to chapter 3, verse 7. Or let's start in verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will lift up your skirts over your face. I will make the nations 
Look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I'll throw filth at you, treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you. And they'll say, wasted is Nineveh. Who's going to grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Thebes? This is, by the way, this is one of the verses that helps us date the book. Are you better than Thebes? It fell in 664. Are you better than them? No. Verse 10. She became an exile. She went into captivity. Come all the way down. Verse 12. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, your troops are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies and fire has devoured. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible scene. And you read that. When you read judgment like that in the Old Testament, especially from the minor prophets, and it's full of judgment, when you read that, it should, uh, it should rekindle in us this fear of God. Fear of God. So, all right, we sort of walk through it. What are the lessons from Nineveh? Like, are you going to teach this in a Sunday school? Don't teach it in a children's Sunday school, by the way. Let them get a little age on them a little bit. Uh, what, do you, what are the lessons that you actually learn? Like, what are the takeaways to help you grow? Well, the first one, uh, first lesson that I, I think you pull from here is we actually need the gospel. We need the gospel. We, you might say it like this, we, we need to, we submit to him humbly, humbly with humility. The gospel reminds us humility. It's what grace does. If you love grace, you are reminded of your own position and, and it creates humility. Grace should not make you proud. I don't know why people that, that believe deeply in grace are prideful. If you believe in grace, what you're saying is, I was a worm and God saved me in Christ. That's what grace does. So we, we believe the gospel. We need the gospel. The second lesson is, uh, <clears throat> is we, we need to take God seriously. Seriously. I want to be careful how I say this. Uh, well, that's Wednesday night. I'm not going to be very careful. Let me just sort of say it. The 80s and 90s saw in churches like ours a church growth movement that, that pressed us to compromise on things in order to be appealing to those that are not church. The motivation was good. We want to reach people, but the way of doing that is, is not good if you compromise on the seriousness of God. And sometimes that started compromising the message in evangelical churches. So the message became lighter. God became much nicer. That he wasn't really mad at sin. He pretty well understood. And then you come to Nahum. Nahum is like a, you, you woke up. You read it. And we are reminded, this is the same God. We are reminded to take God seriously. To take the gospel seriously. To, to take worship seriously. To take Sunday seriously. The Lord raised on a Sunday. We worship on a Sunday to take your church seriously. This is the congregation that God has given you. To take the responsibility of being a Christian man or a Christian woman seriously. Or, or a parent. Or a leader. Seriously. To take the gospel seriously. It's, being serious is not gloomy. It's not... Being serious, it doesn't take joy. Joy is a very serious thing. It doesn't take it away. It means that you focus there. You concentrate. That we really are serious about the goodness of God, about the foulness of sin, about the desire to walk with Him, about reaching people for Christ. We actually are. We can be serious and joyful at the same time. So one of the lessons is we need the gospel. A uh, second lesson is to, to take God seriously. Let me give you a third lesson. God does not change. 
God does not change. I mean, from Jonah to Nahum, two different things happen in one city, but God did not change. You know what changed? They repented in Jonah. They ignored Nahum. It wasn't God that, that changed from Jonah to, Nahum to, to now. I mean, isn't it, um, it's good for us to think about God thinking, thinking these thoughts about America. Like, it's good for us to, for a little bit to think, does God look at America and think that? Does he look at people here that are not in Christ, that are not in Christ as his enemies? Does he feel like that? There is an indication, yes, that God is always saved by grace. He's always done it through faith. He's always used repentance. Now we have the gospel of Christ, and we are called not only to to embrace it and love it and worship on Sundays, to gather together, be strengthened on Wednesdays, but to also tell a world that is under this kind of judgment that God is good and will save them in Christ. So one of the lessons out of uh, Nahum is that God does not change. There's a fourth lesson. I think I've said it. Let me reiterate it. Number four, we are to fear him. Fear God reverently. Like I put, I put these, uh, I made them, I made them, I used assonance. I made them rhyme, rhyme uh, but I didn't use that. Like I would have said, submit to him humbly, take God seriously, worship him joyfully, fear God reverently, serve him continuously. I had five points, they all sounded like that, but I decided to try to explain them instead of give it to you like, like I just gave it to you. <laughs> to fear God, to to realize fear is this, to actually stand in awe of God. Like when I, um, when I first started dating Connie, we were at, um, I went and visited her at Panama City Beach, Florida. She was working a centrifuge camp as the rec director. Centrifuge is a Southern Baptist camp. Me and Connie are so Baptist, so that's how we were. I went to see her there, and uh, she had a free day, and we went uh, in Panama City. They, there was a bungee jump off a crane there. It had a crane, it was 140 feet, 180 feet high. as a platform. It was back when, I mean, they just tied it to your ankles, and you jumped off. And I uh, wanted, I'm still trying to impress her. <laughs> and, you know, if you're a guy, you, don't, you think, that impresses other guys, not girls. Girls think, what's wrong with you? But anyway, I thought maybe this would impress her. So I got up on the uh, platform, and once I got there, it's, there's this weird fear of jumping off this thing. Now, I know it's enjoyable, and it was a lot of fun, but it also was really scary. There's some truth in There's great joy and great depth, great fulfillment. There's great healing. There is great peace. But our, our God is to be feared as well. The, with what he does with sin, the judgment that fell on Christ, the horror the, of Jesus in the garden and how it shook him, that that would have been us. So one of the things I learned from Nahum is that I, I need to fear God. When I say fear, I don't mean coward to the point that I can't look at, but fear that makes me run to the goodness of God found in Jesus. And then the last one is um, when you read Nahum, it reminds us that one of the lessons is we are to serve him continuously. That's the last point. Serve him continuously. Let me tell you where I got that. <clears throat> so we then back up. So we look at the Bible as a whole. We back up and we look at the Bible and we take what we read in Jonah. We know of Jonah, preached in Nineveh. Great revival happens. The people turn to God. They are changed and started to drift. I opened up with an illustration of right here in Charlotte of how this part of the world was settled and who it was settled by. These fire-breathing Christians that over the course of time started to drift. 
And what we want to do is make sure that we lash ourselves to the cross of Christ, to the power of God's word, and we serve him, and we do so faithfully and continually. You read the book of Nahum, and you find out that no one or no thing can stand up against our God. With that in mind, I'd like to say a word of prayer, and after I pray, we'll be dismissed. Let's pray together. Father, we read of your power and your judgment and your vengeance and your wrath. And we are thankful that we can approach you under the merits and in the life of Jesus, our Savior. We, we claim his life for ours. We claim his atoning work on the cross. We thank you for the grace that has been purchased for us. Lord, thank you for the men and women here today. Have a thousand things going on. It could have been anywhere in the world. And yet chose to fight traffic and come and sit with other believers and be encouraged and strengthened. We pray that that would be fruitful. We pray that tomorrow morning you wake us up in enough time to spend some time in your word, that you prepare our hearts, that you use us for good, that you bring us back here Sunday ready to lift up the name of Jesus and to worship. And so go with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.